Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Helga. I want to say how delighted and honored I am that I was invited to address this extremely important conference. Um, as the only member of the delegation from the United States, uh, I wish I had better news to bring from, from home. Um, as I'm sure you all know, the American population has just been subjected to one of the most insane debacle, debacles in, in its history uh, with these two non-qualified uh, candidates. Uh, the only good news I can say is that uh, the American people are now beginning to wake up from the psychotic dream they went through in this election between two candidates proposing basically the same thing. Uh, and our Congress, which is now, as you may know, debating the so-called physical cliff, uh, where they are being told to debate over what, what is the best method for executing huge portions of the American population, how best to destroy them, uh, and that this is the content of the debate. And because of that, as Helga pointed out from Leibniz, that uh, sometimes these horrible conditions are the, are the source of great breakthroughs, uh, that the members of the Congress, like many in the population, um, who are all, and I repeat all, aware of the Glass-Steagall solution and all aware that this has been generated and made a very, very heated issue in the Congress and in the country, that it all came from Mr. LaRouche and this organization. So in that sense, the potential for a miracle, and it would be a miracle with this corrupted, degenerate Congress and, the, uh, and, and population, a dumbed-down population, very much as Jacques described in Europe, uh, it will be a miracle, but miracles are possible. And in fact, that's what our entire purpose here is. So... Uh, before I give my statement, I wish to read to you a, about an eight-minute statement from a very close friend of ours in Japan. Uh, he describes himself, so I will only say that Mr. Daisuke Kotagawa is now the research director with the Canon Institute for Global Studies in Japan. He's the former executive director uh, for Japan at the IMF, which is where we met him. Uh, and before that, for many years, a leading official in the Ministry of Finance in Japan, and in fact, as you'll see, responsible for dealing with the collapse of the bubble in Japan in, 19, in the 1990s. So he writes as follows. I was in, and this is directed to this conference, I, I will add. I was in charge of the restoration of the Japanese economy in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Among others, I was in charge of the liquidation of Sanyo Securities and Yamaichi Securities in 1997, partial nationalization of the Long-Term Credit Bank and the Nippon Credit Bank in 1998, and the establishment of the Industrial Re Revitalization Corporation of Japan in 2003. In this course, we were targets of criticism not only from domestic vo uh, voters, but also from the international opinion leaders for the mismanagement of the Japanese financial sector. Several staff of the supervisory authorities, including the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan, were arrested and found guilty. Some of them committed suicide, including my friends. From this background, it is quite easy for me to predict what will come next in the ongoing financial crisis in the West and in the world, because it really follows the suit of the crisis I experienced in Japan 10 years ago, an unwelcome déjà vu. First, it is essential to identify those who are responsible for this crisis. It is the investment bankers in the Anglo-Saxon countries who were indulging in high-risk gambling types of trading and created the bubble. It is very awkward to see that nobody has been arrested who gained from this bubble. Almost all board members of liquidated or partially nationalized financial institutions during the Japanese financial crisis in 97 and 98 were arrested and prosecuted. The main structural cause of the financial bubble in the United States and Europe from 2002 to 2007 was the complete abolishment of the Glass-Steagall Act in February of 1999. It was abolished under the leadership of Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, whom he always calls Larry, uh, during the process of liberalizing financial markets in the late 20th century. Glass-Steagall was enacted in 1933 in order to divide the business of banking and securities in light of the tragic experiences of the Great Depression. 
surplus liquidity created by an extended period of lax monetary policy in the first decade of the 21st century under the auspices of Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Greenspan fueled the so-called money game by investment banks, which was inconsistent with the laws of real demand. Then there was the serious mistake committed by governments of the United States and the United Kingdom at the liquidation of Lehman Brothers. When Yamaichi Securities closed in, ni- in November of 1997, the Japanese government allowed the liquidation of Yamaichi only after all cross-border uh, transactions were unwound. The main purpose of this was not to let the closure of Yamaichi affect overseas financial institutions and drag Japan into the epicenter of a world depression. This was not the case for the liquidation of Lehman Brothers. Lehman went bankrupt without unwinding its huge volume of cross-border transactions. This had an extraordinary contagious effect on the world financial system, triggering a world depression comparable to the Great Depression before the Second World War. Liquidating Lehman only after all foreign transactions had been unwound could have adverted the worldwide crisis. The next problem involves the process of bailing out financial institutions. U.S. authorities bailed out banks by injecting public money in order to defend the financial system. In light of our experience in Japan, there are three problems with regard to the modality of the bailout in the United States. First, the balance sheets of all major financial institutions were not rigidly examined by any official authority using mark-to-market accounting. Second, the amount of public funds necessary to completely dispose of the non-performing loans in each institution were not identified. Third, each institution did not dispose of its non-performing loans, making it vague to market investors whether or not non-performing loans had or had not been left on the balance sheets. The mark-to-market accounting rule was frozen as a result of pressure by the U.S. Congress The method of examining balance sheets of major financial institutions has not been stringent, unlike in Japan. All major financial institutions avoided liquidation, except Lehman Brothers, but they were kept intact through a bailout and because of their political clout. This situation made it difficult not only to launch fundamental reforms of the financial system, but to fully investigate the real cause of the financial crisis. In particular, It has made it extremely difficult to investigate the responsibility of executives of major banks. As a result, top executives of major banks in the United States have not learned any lessons from the Lehman crisis. It is frightening to think that such executives are likely to make the same mistakes again. Western investment banks, British and American in particular, were kept intact with unhealthy balance sheets. They have not recovered from insolvency. While superficially they look fine, thanks to the bailout, relaxation of accounting rules, and obscure stress tests. To get out of this dangerous situation as soon as possible, they are desperately seeking high returns within a short period of time. And investment banks found good victims for this purpose. Countries which suffer from budget deficits caused by fiscal stimulus they made in 2009 to counter economic downturn, such as Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy. Banks used excess liquidity in the market, which had been supplied by central banks, supposedly to enhance the economy, but which failed to stimulate the economy due to the lack of real demand. Short sales, credit default swaps are used by means of attack. Consequently, European countries have had to rely upon fiscal austerity. Too loud? This has been devastating. This this has devastating effect on the recovery of the European economy. As is well witnessed in the economic crisis in Japan, at the time of economic crisis after the collapse of the financial bubble, the household sector and the corporate sector suffered from a hangover of overborrowing during the bubble period. They tried to squeeze their balance sheets in order to repay loans. Left alone, this would result in the shrinking of the national economy. It is the government sector that has to increase its expenditure to prop up the domestic economy by way of deficit. But the attack by the market has made it difficult for European countries to rely upon such policies. I am afraid that the European countries are entering a vicious circle of economic contraction. Fundamental change of thought to battle against the economic crisis is essential now. Instead of relying upon austerity, rules and regulations which would make it impossible for banks to attack countries – 
such as Glass-Steagall law, should be introduced. With the introduction of Glass-Steagall, for the purpose of splitting commercial banks and investment banks, large banks will have to conduct due diligence in order to identify their assets and liabilities. It is highly likely that such due diligence will reveal that investment banks are insolvent and that there are no other options for them than liquidation. Canceling out their positions would substantially reduce the liabilities of the commercial banks. It is hoped that by conducting this process and possibly the injection of public money into commercial banks, balance sheets of financial institutions in Western countries will be cleared and confidence in the sector will be restored. This is a prerequisite for economic recovery from the crisis. The options left to us are very clear. Interests of bankers or interests of the general public? The answer should be very simple. Huge amounts of money have been used to bail out banks. Such money was wasted. It did not help investment banks improve their balance sheets. Instead, they were engaged in another round of speculative trading. Such money should have been used instead to stimulate the real economy. Provision of excess liquidity by central banks has failed to create real demand, and funds have been abused in attacking European governments and thereby brought about misfortune to the general public in those countries. Fiscal stimulus has to be used for the purpose of investments, not for the sake of government or private consumption. It should be recalled that the stimulus package in the United States in 2009 was absolutely inefficient in this regard. With the depth of economic contraction all over the world, government should launch upon a global scale of large infrastructure projects to create real demand on a global scale. In addition to relaxation of international rules that have been prohibited, that have prohibited private money from taking risks, such as Basel III, governments should extend an umbrella in such forms as government guarantees to large-scale infrastructure projects so that affluent resources in the market will be mobilized effectively to take risks on these projects. That's from Mr. Kotagawa. So I think you see we have some good friends in Asia. Uh, I hope in the future we'll have some of them here in subsequent conferences to discuss these ideas and the urgency thereof. So I, I'm, I, I've been asked to speak on the global land bridge, much of which has been said uh, by, by Helga, by uh, Jacques, by uh, Hussein, and others. So um, I won't go over that material again, but I, I would like to provide something of an historical framework for the battle to unite the cultures of Eurasia and the world. And I'll begin with uh, two quotes, one from, um, <clears throat> one from Gottfried Leibniz, one of the greatest minds of Western civilization, and another by Rudyard Kipling, who was a literary spokesman for the British Empire. Leibniz wrote in 1697 in his journal Novissima Sinica, News from China, as follows. I consider it a singular plan of the fates that human cultivation and refinement should today be concentrated, as it were, in the two extremes of our continent, in Europe and China, which adorns the Orient as Europe does the opposite side, edge of the earth. Perhaps supreme providence has ordained such an arrangement so that as the most cultivated and distant peoples stretch out their arms to each other, those in between may gradually be brought to a better way of life. How do I turn on the first one here? Ah, there, okay. I just want the picture of the land bridge up there while we talk. The second quote from Rudyard Kipling, who grew up in the Raj in South Asia, uh, in his poem, Ballad of East and West, had this to say. Oh, east is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. And I want to emphasize that this is not just a poetic statement by Mr. Kipling, but a very conscious statement of the policy of the British Empire. Just as the Roman Empire was based on divide and conquer, and so that has been the policy of empire from the beginning of empire to today. Throughout history, this battle between especially Europe and Asia east and west. And when I speak of Asia and the east here, I mean East Asia, Southeast Asia, 
South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and of course Southwest Asia, which we've been discussing intently here today. The battle took the form of those who, like Aristotle, uh, believe that man is born either as a slave or as a master, that the brain is essentially empty, capable only, like a computer, of taking data from the outside through sense perceptions and manipulating that data, but not capable of any unique creative actions. And, of course, these people believe that the role of the elite uh, should be to rule over the lesser races, what sometimes is called the white man's burden. And that, by the way, is another phrase from Mr. Rudyard Kipling, who wrote an essay of that name, and who sent that essay to none other than Theodore Roosevelt in the United States after the U.S. had liberated the Philippines from Spanish imperial rule, encouraging Mr. Roosevelt to maintain full control over the Philippines, which, of course, Roosevelt, that Roosevelt, was most willing to do, and America began to become a British-style colonial power, which lasted until the time of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, on the other hand, though, there are those who, like Plato, believe that uh, man is defined by the creative power of the mind, the ability to generate new concepts about uh, universal principle. And for them, of course, mankind should be united uh, behind the idea of participating in that discovery of universal principle. Uh, Lynn and Helga LaRouche, as you all know, have often posed the future of mankind, which is based upon the idea of the global land bridge. Um, the contiguous areas being connected by high-speed rail, physical connections in that way, and with uh, scholars and um, statesmen of all the different cultures, and in the case of Eurasia, the Judeo-Christian culture, the Islamic culture, and the Confucian culture, meeting together on a regular basis to uh, further man's mastery of the universe and the advancement of civilization. But it should be clear to all of us here today that the other side uh, has the upper hand in the world today. And they're prepared and willing to end civilization as we know it precisely because they see development of that sort as their primary enemy, as that which will undermine the power of the financial oligarchy which characterizes the British Empire. Um, and the history of that battle for in Eurasia between those two forces is really what I want to address today in brief. Uh, the first real connections of Asia and the East and West were over the Silk Road, <clears throat> uh, named for the silk that was so prized in Europe uh, from, from China and Asia. Let me get some water. Um, but I, it, and there's a, there's a deep history to that Silk Road from um, from the Greeks, from Rome, um, from the, the the Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty in in, uh, in China. But I, I want to skip over that and go straight to the 12th and 13th centuries when Europe was already essentially bankrupt after two years of insane crusades, <clears throat> uh, manipulated wars between Europe uh, and the Arabs in the Arab world, uh, the Muslim world, uh, manipulated by Venice, uh, manipulated by the moneylenders, who in the process of getting these forces to kill each other uh, were able to bankrupt these countries and thereby control them, which was the aim of the empire all along. And it is to date as well. <clears throat> um, in Asia, at the same time, the Mongols were mobilizing their hordes for their, their conquest. The Mongols themselves were <laughs> a, a sort of a mishmash of various uh, religions and cults, uh, Tantric Buddhism, Nestorian Christianity, uh, several uh, mystery cults from Persia. Uh, and in the process of their, uh, of their crusade, you might say, they started by the crushing of the great Chinese renaissance of the Sung dynasty, 
destroying it, depopulating much of China, moved on through the Islamic world, destroying the opposite caliphate, uh, sacking Baghdad, and then moved on into Central Europe. Very carefully, it should be noted, that w- these are the uh, general uh, boundaries of the empire. <clears throat> Higher now. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I got you. Um, and moving through, through, through Europe, but um, as you'll notice, carefully avoiding Venice. And there's a reason for that, which is that the Mongol uh, uh, invasions were very carefully coordinated with Venice from the time even before and then uh, as characterized, you might say, by Marco Polo, the Venetian, who is not the great hero he's portrayed to be, but in fact one of the moneylenders from Venice who coordinated the empire with this Mongol horde. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, they also, of course, brought with them the plague, which uh, managed to continue depopulating Europe for another century after the Mongols themselves had retired to the, uh, to the steppes of Asia. But it was uh, really only the Renaissance which freed Europe from uh, the, the impact of this Mongol horde, from the from the plague, and from Venice, most importantly, from the empire. And it was only by the the revival of the ideas of the Platonic uh, Greek culture, uh, aided very much, as as I'm sure you know, by the the Islamic Renaissance, which had uh, retained these these Greek ideas and then came back into Europe. And so Nicholas of Cusa, one of the great thinkers of the Renaissance, one of the founders of the Renaissance, you might say, uh, was immediately thinking about how to extend these Renaissance ideas into the rest of the world. He, he had the idea of sailing west uh, and getting to Asia and discovering whatever might lie in between, which is, in fact, his concept, which ultimately were picked up by Christopher Columbus and led to the founding of the New World. Uh, and it was his idea of getting this Platonic Renaissance concept in, as a global concept, and especially to Asia. The Jesuits at that time were, in, were moving into China for the first time. And they, too, were taking the science of the Renaissance into China. Uh, soon after their arrival, they approached Johannes Kepler, uh, another of the greatest minds of European science, uh, and asked him to prepare his material on the harmony of the spheres and the, um, the uh, dynamic laws of the universe to prepare, to present to the Chinese people. And I should point out that they also approached, approached Galileo, the Venetian, and asked him to prepare his work for the Chinese, and he wasn't the least bit interested in being Venetian, uh, and did nothing, snubbed the request which the Chinese should be forever grateful. Um, uh, So the Jesuits found in China an extremely advanced culture, in many ways far more advanced than Europe before the Renaissance, uh, and a population and a a leadership committed to science, to the study of science, and very open to collaboration with this new scientific concept coming from Asia. Um, And... Uh, They were also very surprised to find that Muslims who had come across the Silk Road were by and large the leading astronomers and scientists in the Chinese Empire. These same Jesuits uh, negotiated the first treaty between Russia and China in 1689, which defined the borders between these huge nations, uh, which lasted right into the 20th century. Um, Later, Gottfried Leibniz himself became extremely uh, involved in the China question. He was reading translations from the Jesuits of Confucius, of Mencius, of the great Song Dynasty philosopher Zhu Xi, uh, and published an essay called The Natural Theology of the Chinese, and he started the journal Novissum Seneca, which I took that quote from at the beginning, with the intent of sharing these ideas between Europe and China. And as I'm sure you know, he was also at that time Leibniz, Uh, working with the new czar in Russia, Peter the Great, and had the idea that with Russia, China, and Europe, the three could unite Eurasia and break the power of empire once and for all. Leibniz wrote to Peter the Great in 1712 as follows. It appears to be the will of God that science should encompass the globe 
and should now come to Russia, and that for that purpose its instrument should be Your Majesty. For you are so situated that you can take the best from Europe on the one side and from China on the other, and through good institutions provide upon the achievements of both. But then again, there was Venice. Uh, in this case, the Venetians broke this potential for what could have become the greatest era of global collaboration and development. Uh, they broke it by their control over certain corrupt popes, uh, whom they persuaded to issue a papal bull denouncing Confucianism, uh, saying that Confucianism was incompatible with Christianity and that uh, anyone who would become a Christian must renounce Confucianism, stomp on their tablets. Uh, contrast that to what Leibniz had to say about Confucianism. He wrote in the Natural Theology of the Chinese as follows, It is pure Christianity, insofar as it renews the natural law which is inscribed in our hearts, except for what revelation and grace add to it to improve upon our nature. But the intention of the Venetians and um, empire, as always, was to crush that kind of collaboration. And since Confucianism was not just the, um, uh, the mode of thought uh, of the Chinese, but it was also their code of government. It was the um, constitution of a sort, the basis upon which their government was organized to be good. Uh, so when you denounced Confucianism, you were also denouncing the government. Uh, and, of course, as the Venetians intended, the Chinese then, therefore, were forced to expel this subversive element, which had become subversive, from China altogether. And the result in China was that they turned inwards, decayed to a certain extent, and were set up for the next century when the British gunboats and opium arrived and laid waste to China and most of Asia for more than a century to come. So again, empire had succeeded in, uh, in defeating this humanist effort. So in the meantime, however, the United States had evolved and uh, uh, based on the principles that Leibniz represented very much. So by the time of the British Opium Wars in 1840s and 1860s, uh, the, U the U.S. had developed machines that were machines for power, for machinery, for transportation, which were the wonder of the world. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's economist, Henry Carey, whom we've heard some discussion of here, and his collaborators who had built the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States, let me go back to the land bridge, by the way, who had, uh, who had built that Transcontinental Railroad with the idea that it was aimed at Asia. It was an arrow, not just to the west coast of the United States, but by shipping into Asia, where what they considered to be the natural alliance between the new American Republic and Asia would be forged and to break the power of European colonialism over Asia in general. Uh, Kerry then uh, became a collaborator of the, uh, of the Russians, and this idea, they had talked about what they called a... Um, to girdle the earth, uh, to, to generalize, to inter internationalize the transcontinental railroad, what they said, to girdle the earth with a tramway of iron. And uh, so in, in Russia, this became the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which was, in fact, the first iron uh, land bridge, the first iron silk road. And as, <clears throat> as you all know, Kerry also became an advisor to Bismarck. Uh, who had already uh, been very familiar with the work of another American uh, economist, American system economist, Friedrich List, <clears throat> and had built Germany through the Zollverein based on the protectionist principles that List had taught and conveyed uh, against the British free trade policies and thus, of course, marked himself as an enemy of the British. And with Kerry, he then developed the idea of building a railroad to Asia. And it was this... I guess I didn't do that one. It was the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, which was the final straw for the British, the causus belli, uh, who then moved quickly to have Bismarck brought down using their family relations with the Kaiser. Uh, 
And by 1890, Bismarck was removed. Within a few short years, essentially, World War I began. It began with the Japanese uh, attack on China, very much the way World War II later began. Uh, manipulated by the British, who were then had become the seat of the Venetian Empire. It was now located in London. Uh, and <clears throat> by launching that war in Asia and then the Balkan Wars, <clears throat> they had by uh, soon the entire global World War I begun. And again, empire had, had won. With the end of that war, you had the British and the French implementing Sykes-Picot, which has been discussed here. I won't go through it. Uh, but the intent clearly was to divide up the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic world in such a way that there would not be collaboration between the different parts of that world. There would be no infrastructure, and there still is basically none today, uh, connecting these different parts. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that, uh, that Helga and this program, which Hussein laid out, is aimed at rectifying. Uh, the Franklin Roosevelt, of course, had intended that the results of World War II, which was just an extension of World War I, uh, with the results of his work in America uh, would be extended around the world to, again, end empire, to uh, not allow the return of the European colonial powers. But instead, we ended up with, uh, after his death and the takeover of the United States by British puppets like, like Truman, uh, we ended up supporting the European colonial powers back into Asia, and we had 30, 40 years of hideous, insane wars like the Indochina War, the Vietnam War, and others in Africa. And now, similar wars across the Middle East. So, <clears throat> um, the work of, at this point, the work of Lynn and Helga is literally the proof that there is an alternative to this insanity and that it can and must this time succeed. And as everyone has pointed out, this time there is thermonuclear war hanging over our heads, so we have no choice. It must succeed. Uh, Lynn began uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, to deal with the Middle East crisis through his OASIS plan. I won't go through that. It's been discussed. Uh, I, I would add there, though, that most importantly, as Jacques also pointed out, Lynn's intention at that point was that if you're going to solve the crisis between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it must begin with the skilled scientific knowledge of the Israelis who had greened the desert in Israel, working hand-in-hand -hand with the skilled workforce of the Palestinians in extending that idea of greening the desert throughout the entire region and building the manufacturing and industrial capacities and agricultural capacities necessary. That idea of economic development first as a basis for mutual interest in a peaceful uh, political solution is the exact opposite of the British imperial policy, which says, no, we can't talk about development. We have to have a political solution first, which, of course, is intended that there will never be a political solution and, of course, no development. So in, in 1988, as Lynn was being railroaded to prison with myself and others, uh, he proposed a very bold plan for the integration of Eastern and Western Europe uh, with uh, his forecast, his correct forecast, that there would soon be an end to the communist empire uh, and that the basis upon which we in Europe uh, should approach the Eastern European nations was through agriculture and industrial collaboration and development. Uh, this led to what was known as the Productive Triangle, the Paris-Berlin-Vienna Triangle as the industrial heartland of, of Europe extending out into the east, into Russia, into Asia, into Africa. Uh, that then led to the idea of the new Silk Road. Soon Helga was known around the world as the Silk Road Lady, um, conveying this idea not just for Eurasia but for the world, the concept of peace through development, uh, through these great development corridors, uh, which, along which you would have new cities, nuclear-powered nuplex cities, and new population centers as a basis for peace through development. Uh, Helga was at the same time, of course, uh, fighting against the injustice done to her husband and myself and others, often traveling with my late, late wife, Gail. Uh, but the purpose of that tour was to locate that fight against injustice 
in the fact that we must achieve this global development policy, and that's why LaRouche was subjected to that attack, was to get him out of the way. So <clears throat> if you look at the Eurasian land bridge, just the Euro Euro European part of this, the three prongs, the northern prong is the, Sib the, the Siberian Railroad, which, of course, was long since completed. The central prong through uh, western China into uh, Kazakhstan and, and then into Asia is, has recently been completed, and over the last year there have been shipments going from the, uh, the uh, far, far east coast of China all the way to Europe, train shipments. Uh, that route is now under very active consideration by Russia and China and others for vast improvement uh, because China opening up its own interior is now creating industrial productive zones in, in their far west. Uh, and, of course, it, it makes no sense to have to move those goods to the coast and then around to the Middle East and Europe and, and America, but rather to ship them directly across. So this is being actively built up. The southern route down through Southeast Asia has, it doesn't, doesn't exist yet, um, largely because the British uh, and their fools in Washington uh, had isolated and uh, prevented any kind of development in a couple of hub states like Myanmar and Laos. This has recently been resolved through the very strong efforts of the Asian countries and with some friends in the United States largely centered around Hillary Clinton's State Department. Uh, so what's happening now in Laos and Myanmar and Cambodia, Vietnam, is a, a burst of infrastructure development and finally building the rail connections that will allow for the through, through connections of the southern route, uh, an extremely important development, by the way. Another milestone in... Uh, by, by, by Lin was in Moscow in 2007 when the Russians organized the conference. Oh, excuse me. I meant to say that that whole process led to the historic conference in 1996 in Beijing, uh, which Helga addressed as the Silk Road Lady. That was called the International Symposium of Development for the Regions Along the Eurasian Asia uh, Continental Bridge. Uh, there were 36 countries participating in that conference, uh, which was co-organized by the Chinese government, by the Schiller Institute, and others. Uh, and Helga's presentation on building the Silk Road land bridge as a grand design for peace through development uh, was absolutely crucial in the work that's continued to go on by the Chinese in their own country and, as we've seen, in Africa and around the world. Uh, so then the conference in, in Russia on the, what's called the Mega Projects, this is in 2007, the Mega Projects of Russia's East, a transcontinental Eurasia-America transport link via the Bering Strait. And we haven't discussed it much today, but you see the circle there. This idea of building a tunnel under the Bering Strait had been something LaRouche had fought for for 30 years as one of the great projects absolutely necessary for uh, bringing the world out of the mess of its in. Uh, and he, was, uh, he presented a paper to this conference. Uh, it was at a time that the British were renewing their plan for war against Russia. They were beginning to call Putin the new Stalin uh, and trying to mobilize America to demonize Russia and prepare for re reviving the uh, war between East and West. Um, but, but the message that Lynn took to this conference, and which was uh, reflected in statements by other Americans there and the Russians and Mr. Putin, was that this project, the idea of building physically a connection between the United States and Russia, an actual rail bridge, uh, and thus uplifting the productive powers of labor on both sides, creating the mutual self-interest in development, was the only basis for war avoidance, as well as solving other political problems. So um, this concept is still, today, the most crucial in terms of our uh, counterposing what can be done rather than the effort to get the United States into a war with Russia and China. So to conclude, I want to just very quickly touch on 
um, some of these great projects which haven't been discussed exactly today. You've heard the word NAWAPA. Some of you may not be familiar with it. This is a map of the greatest infrastructure prog project ever devised by man. The only large, larger one up before this point is what China is doing with moving its water from the south to the north. But this would bring water down from Alaska and the Yukon into the great American desert. Uh, it would double the agricultural land in America and northern Mexico. It would create three to four million jobs like that, and, and millions more in terms of industrial development that would come out of this, the new cities, the high-speed rail, the nuclear power plants, and so forth. Um, the, um, the, the similar water project in Asia, uh, the idea of what's called the Trans-Aqua Project, is to bring the water, as was pointed out by our friend from Egypt, the huge amounts of water from the Congo move it north uh, into the Chad, refill the Chad Lake, which is, has collapsed as much as the Aral Sea that you saw the other day, uh, and in that way pushing the desert back, very much the way uh, uh, he spoke about filling the Katara Depression and pushing the, the desert back from the north. Um, and then the Arctic. I won't say much about this, but if you think about the you hear now about the competition over the great resources in the Arctic. Well, this is exactly a place where it's the cooperation among nations in the development of these resources, not only because there's rich resources, but because in establishing habitable territory in these areas that are very hard to create habitable territory, you are beginning the process of figuring out how we're going to colonize the moon and colonize Mars. Um, so... Finally, are we going to survive? Is the human race fit to survive? Tony Blair made very, very clear back in 1999 why the British Empire is willing to go to thermonuclear war. He said that the age of the peace of Westphalia is behind us. It no longer functions. The idea of sovereign nation states no longer works in this modern world i.e., we must go back to a world government, to world empire, and that if Russia and China, or any other countries for that matter, uh, don't accept this, if they simply refuse to cooperate, then while it might be preferable to solve it peacefully, preferable, as Obama said the other day, about it would be best, it would be preferable not to have a new Mideast war. But while preferable not to have a war, war nonetheless is necessary in those conditions if they don't back down to the end of sovereignty and the end of the peace of Westphalia. So uh, this is not new. The British Empire was always based on this concept of either world empire or war, uh, or both. And uh, the American Revolution put a dent in that project but we now have in Bush and in Obama basically a British-run United States. Uh, it can be reversed, but that's the situation we have today. And so when we look at this, I, what we've heard today and yesterday, uh, these are not just good projects. These are the essential projects which are required to be implemented, but both because they are good and because they are the only means of war avoidance. Uh, and that, therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us here today to recognize that this is the last chance we have to realize the best hopes of the greatest minds of history. So, thank you. <laughs>